Hi viewers, in this episode I welcome Hugh Evans to the channel to discuss his amazing discovery and new book, The Origin of the Zodiac, Kader Idris and the Star Maps of Gwyneth. The Star Maps of Gwyneth are the key to a language and culture that connects all the ancient civilizations back in time to the gods before the Great Flood. Hugh Evans worked as an aeronautical engineer and chartered accountant before applying his professional scrutiny to a lifelong passion for history, offering a new perspective and rediscovering the story of Kader Idris and the star maps of Gwyneth. The origin of the zodiac has been rediscovered and the star maps of Gwyneth may well change everything we believe about our recent history. Join Hugh and I as we take a deep dive into his amazing research and book. Hello there, welcome to my Nutrient Nirvana channel, History, Health and Wellbeing. Uh, in this episode, or this adventure, we're going to be reviewing another book. There we are, can you see it? The Origins of the Zodiac. It's a lovely photo on the front. And there's the author's name, Hugh Evans. And Hugh is with me today. Hello, Hugh. How are you? I'm well, Paul. Hi, how are you? Yeah, great. Thanks, mate. Really, really, really enjoying this book. It's fantastic work. Um, about two thirds of the way through it now, learning loads. It's a fascinating yeah. subject. I, um, I contacted you and got this book after watching your presentation on megalithomania the conference that took place in glastonbury this year um there's every presentation is always very interesting but um your particular presentation left left me with my jaw on the floor um <laughs> it was oh my god this is absolutely fascinating it really you. you've really made um an amazing discovery and um i can't recommend this book to viewers enough uh, there's all sorts of information that back up what you're saying and there's also some really nice really nice artwork in the book as well I think some of which you've done yourself so you're a very talented guy yeah yeah um, so try and get a, a copy of this you will not be disappointed um, so before we get into the subject matter Hugh I thought yeah. I would just ask you when did you first become interested in astronomy well, it's one of my earliest memories and from, you know, sort of the age where you can, you're just walking and learning about the world. Um, I would ask my parents, what's that? And that, one of the earliest uh, things I saw in the night sky was the Seven Sisters, which is now more commonly known as the Pleiades. But when I was young, we used the old names for the constellations. So I was told it was the Seven Sisters. Oh, okay. Very interesting. Um, so what prompted you to start your research in the area of Gwyneth in North Wales? What was, what was the first thing that alerted your attention to it? Um, I've been re reading around the subject uh, for quite some time. And um, I, I, I just love reading about history and um, all the ancient stuff was always a favourite of mine. And it was at the start of lockdown, COVID, that I looked at a map of my, uh, of the area that my father's family was from in North Wales and just happened to see a mountain called Cadda Idris. And um, I knew that Idris was Enoch. And um, I then started looking around um, the area and saw a few lakes with names. And I thought, oh, there was one lake called Goat's Lake. And I thought, could that be Capricorn? Um, I've been speaking with Ross Broadstock of the Britain's Hid Hidden History Channel for some while about the Wilson and Blackett work in South Wales. So we'd been looking at... Um, uh, ancient sites and sight lines and solstice risings and things like that in South Wales. So I immediately thought maybe there's something going on here. And I was recommended a book which is called Arwen by Mike Harris. And 
Um, he'd identified uh, two of the constellations correctly in the center of the star map. They, they are the, um, the bear and the little bear, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And from that point, I was able to piece together the star maps of Gwyneth. And my big break breakthrough was realizing that the rivers um, were the ecliptic because as soon as you find the ecliptic, you can find all the constellations around the um, the, the ecliptic. So, could you could you give us a brief explanation of what the ecliptic is? The ecliptic is um, the apparent path of the sun against the night sky, as viewed from Earth. So, obviously, we go around the sun, but because we are the observer, the sun appears to move um, through the heavens along a constant path and that path is called the ecliptic and it's also the path that all the planets move along because we're all going around the sun in the same plane and in my um, presentation which I will um, like to show a bit later on I will go into that in a bit more detail with some pictures so people can see what it means. Fantastic brilliant you said that um, you knew that Idris was Enoch how did you know that? Um, well, just through reading, background reading, I've been to um, Megalithomania Conference of Origins in London, November 2018, I think, and Hugh Newman talked about um, the giants of Britain, and uh, Idris was one of the three great astronomers who charted the heavens uh, uh, in ancient British mythology, and they were all supposed to be giants. Mm -hmm. So um, that immediately sort of like um, rang a bell when I saw Idris mm. on there on the, on the map on the ground. Okay. So could you could you explain to our viewers exactly what is a star map? What are we talking about here? Um, there are lots of different sorts of star maps. Um, maybe you know in my presentation I will go through several of them, and um, you know. Uh, we're quite familiar these days with what a star map is. We would go online or we'd open up a, a, like an atlas, a book. But in ancient times, they didn't have these uh, methods available to them. So they had to do other things. But, you know, I'll, I will, I'll go through it a bit more in, the, in my presentation. Brilliant. OK. Um, I wanted to just, um, if I may, I just wanted to read a couple of paragraphs on page eight of your book. Yeah, so sure. Go ahead. Very, very interesting. So it says here, based on my research, the star maps of Gwynedd, North Wales, covering 1,500 square miles, appear to be the origin of the complete zodiac and modern Ptolemaic constellations that we have today. If correct, the star maps of Gwynedd are the largest Neolithic construction on Earth and demonstrate a profound understanding of the universe including the current location of our galactic center. That's yeah. some impressive stuff. I just wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned here the largest Neolithic construction. So we're talking about uh, our ancient ancestors constructing a star map. Yeah, they built wow. it. That's pretty impressive stuff. And, and now, since finishing that book, and I'm uh, writing the companion book, The Origin of Time, um, I estimate the star map area is now over 2,000 square miles. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. Okay. Um, why, why do you think it's important to make this uh, or to, to reconnect with our ancestors? Why is that important? And why do you think that the Gwynedd star map is the key to re-establishing that connection? Um, well, um, I... As, a, as someone who's researched, read and visited lots of ancient sites, I think, you know, they all deserve being preserved just um, because it's part of our history. And um, I think, as uh, Cicero said, that if I'm going to really quote him badly here, but uh, if uh, those people who have, have their history hidden, they, they remain just children. They, they have no idea of, of where they've come from and where they're going to, you know, and it's a state of um, 
ignorance that actually is being put down upon us by some groups because they don't want us to know our ancient history, I think. And I think that's very sad. And uh, I would like to um, make sure that this ancient artifact, which I think is the most important ancient artifact in the world, is never lost again, because it was lost, um, certainly to the mainstream understanding. If you go to North Wales, they, they still live it, you know, they feel it, live it, breathe it, and, and it's not lost to them. And to come back, to, uh, to come to the second part of your question, um, it, it is a spiritual journey as well. And I certainly have learned a lot on that spiritual, uh, spiritual journey, of that spiritual journey, as a result of researching the star maps of Gwynedd. It, it's the ancient British spirituality, and it's probably proto-Christian, if you want to, uh, as well. So, um, and these people, they were um, in harmony with their environment and um, their understanding of spirituality. And we've actually lost a lot of that today. You know, Absolutely. we've substituted um, happiness with material things and mm -hmm. nonsense and media. And uh, we're, no, we're no better off. You know, our ancient ancestors would look at us and go, what on earth are you doing? absolutely we're definitely on the same page there you definitely i think it was i think it was graham hancock who said that we are a species with amnesia he did I, I think that just about sums it up really um well, very... we're, we're also a species with deafness and blindness to our ancient heritage and um why are the star maps of Gwyneth so important well it actually allows us to take off the off the earmuffs, if you like, and listen to um, this pre-civilization because they're actually talking to us. Mm. When they set out the constellations, it was extremely important to them to c convey a message of spirituality, amongst other things. Mm. And they were very proud of what they were doing and were very thorough and specific. The constellations are not a random group of um, mythical beasts, animals, and implements. They all have meaning. They are all in the correct place. All their names ex explain what they do and uh, their adjacencies with other constellations. Hmm. Well, I think uh, prior to the uh, Ptolemy, I think, was it the Babylonians that were the first astronomers? Um, and they had more uh, signs in the zodiac than we do today, if I remember rightly. Is that correct? Well, I would uh, I would struggle to um, say that was correct. They were one of the first people to write things down, and um, the constellations have been uh, admired and um, understood for far longer than the Babylonian um, people. Um, they just wrote it down. So if you're talking about Muller Pin, the star catalogue, which is circa 1000 before current era, you know, the star maps of Gwyneth are thousands of years older than that. And uh, Gebekli Tepe has a representation of some of the constellations on Pillar 43 and Enclosure D. So that, that's carbon dated at 11,000 BCE is it or 11,000 years ago certainly a lot longer than the Babylonian civilizations and it depends what you mean by the Babylonians because you know they were there were several succeeding very different peoples the Sumerians the Akkadians the Assyrians the Neo-Babylonians the Chaldeans they were all they all succeeded each other and then wanted to represent the previous culture's information with their own idiosyncrasies mm. okay Fascinating stuff. Okay, should we um should we make a start here? Should we? Yeah. You're, gonna, you're gonna share some stuff with us today on screen. Yes. So let's get started and let's uh, present to the viewers your research, your amazing research. So, okay, I need to just just move a few screens about. So, I will share my screen. And there okay. we are. There we are. Okay, so what we have is um, 
This is my book, The Origin of the Zodiac. Um, I believe the star maps of Gwyneth is the origin of the Zodiac. So um, for people's understanding, I will show you where Gwyneth is. So let's zoom in from Europe to Britain, Wales. Now you can see the top corner here, um, and that is Gwyneth. And the star maps of Gwyneth cover a million acres. Wow. So um, 2,000 square miles. And there are the 12 signs of the zodiac, and the orange line is the ecliptic, and these are that's these are the major rivers which the ecliptic um follows and water was believed to be a movement of spirit so it makes complete sense that um the rivers were the ecliptic and they're named to reflect that and that's part of the detail in my book mm -hmm. so i put on the southern constellations here so these uh, constellations, Centaurus, Crux, um, the Great Ship, these aren't visible in Wales. And uh, for them to be mapped accurately, uh, it required a people who had circumnavigated the globe or at least got down to the equator to understand where all the stars were in the Southern Hemisphere. Mm. The, um, the, the star Alpha Centauri in Centaurus is Snowden, so you can't you can't move a mountain around. You can uh, create a map on a mountain, but once you started making these um, constellations, you can't suddenly get a rubber out and move it over a little bit. Mm -hmm. So there's the northern uh, circumpolar constellations in the middle, and it's centered on the sacred mountain Cadar Idris, which is there. Can you see my cursor? Yes, just about. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to zoom in on that. There, there is the plough. You might be familiar with that shape and zoom yep. in a bit more. And this is the, uh, the mountain of Kada Idris. And that is Kada Idris. And if uh, you ever get a chance to go there, yep. you should, because it's probably the most um, spiritual mountain in Britain. It's and already on my, uh, on my agenda for next year, Hugh. I will be visiting the area, definitely. Okay. Well, maybe we'll uh, climb it together. That would be nice. So in my book, there's a little place here uh, next to the uh, the lake, which is I call the altar. And this, this is a, a threshold that's been created just so the lake has a constant um, uh, sort of depth. And this altar here is the point where you can see the sun rising um, over this great chair of the mountain. Wow. So... That's Gwyneth. And this is the centre of the galaxy. And our ancient ancestor astronomers knew the centre of the galaxy or the direction uh, to it. And on the star maps of Gwyneth, they marked this point um, by naming all the places around it. It's just to within the ecliptic uh, in near the constellation Sagittarius on the Milky Way, as you'd expect, because that's what the galaxy is, the Milky Way. And um, they did this thousands of years ago because the field boundaries have not changed. All the, all the fields in North Wales, they're all stone walls. It's not like England where you can sort of move fields about. And uh, because the agriculture is um, looking after sheep, and they're, they're mainly tenant farmers, or used to be right up until recent years. It means that none of these field boundaries have changed for thousands of years. And, and it's, it's preserved the wow. star maps of Gwyneth intact. So what is a star map? That was a question you raised earlier, Paul. And this is um, an image from Stellarium uh, software. So I use Stellarium and you can see um, the planets here in a line. There's the sun represented uh, in the night sky. And this is an image of the plough from my book that I created. So I, I'm using Stellarium and also using Google Earth. And I've also in my book created um, these maps on the ground where, this, uh, where the constellations above 
are represented on the ground. So these are star maps, but this is a star map. Hmm. And uh, 12 at the top represents the sun at mm -hmm. its maximum daily height. And if you point the hour hand at the sun, any time of the day in the Northern Hemisphere, then due south is halfway between noon and the hour hand. And if we go back to the medieval times, these are the sort of star maps that were um, more common, I suppose. Um, they're like, uh, this is the uh, West Portico of Chartres Cathedral, circa 1200 current era, St. Mark's, St. Mark's Square, 1500 current era. And the Glastonbury Zodiac are a famous group of field zodiacs in England. And some of these had, um, were just uh, useful in terms of being able to show the uh, passage of the year. But others were like the Glastonbury Zodiac. It's probably just a, a um, <coughs> excuse me, it's probably just something that they did for fun. But this esoteric knowledge was sort of shown and uh, people would demonstrate that they had a connection to the Zodiac because um, it represented, they had perhaps an inside view of things. Mm. If we go back even further, the Dendera Zodiac is circa... 500, is it CBE? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I've, uh, the temple was built probably about 100 BCE, but it represents knowledge that goes back quite a lot further into the past. Uh, the Nebra Sky Disc, again, is circle of first millennium BCE. And if you uh, know this uh, sky disc, it's uh, someone's gone to a great amount of trouble to make it out of bronze and gold. And both of those were pr precious metals at the time mm -hmm. and could have been used for other tasks. So it was important for them. And the reason why they built it out of bronze and gold is to make it last because though uh, you can see even today it's not really tarnished much and it hasn't rusted or deteriorated anyway so this is the babylonian zodiac which has been recreated by gavin white from his book babylonian star law which um, was one of my great resources and again this is created from mullapin and previous um cuneiform records from the time of the Ca the Akkadian Empire the um Zagon the Great um created the library at Nineveh um when he came to power as um a, a means of asserting his authority prior to that the Sumerians had a mainly verbal tradition they hadn't written it all down so let's go back even further in time and we have Stonehenge. So um, the Aubrey hole, post holes, um, have been carbon dated to around 10,000 years old. So um, the Stonehenge itself is probably only 3,250 before current era. But Gobekli Tepe has been carbon dated to 12,000 years old. And we can see here uh, Pillar 43 of Enclosure D with Scorpio and some other constellations. And the cave drawings in Lasso in south southwest France, they show Taurus, the Pleiades, and maybe some other constellations, and they've been carbon dated to 15,000 years old. And a lot of these sites are keep getting redated backwards in time. Mm. But these are star maps. And it does beg the question, why make a star map? Mm -hmm. That's my next slide. So why make a star map? And it's to manage time. It's to um, be able to predict things, to control things. Today, we take all this for granted. You know, mm -hmm. um, if we want to know the time, we can look on a watch or on our phone or on the internet. And if you've agreed to meet someone somewhere, then the trains all run to the same system 
uh, or if you've got a contract to deliver goods, um, you can re be assured of that at least time is going to be held commonly between the parties, which actually wasn't always the case. Um, Roman emperors and their consuls had the legal authority to change how many days there were in a year. And they would do this to their advantage. So it created all manner of uh, problems. <laughs> so if you can imagine um, trying to go about your business and not having control of time or being able to determine when things were done within the framework of time, can you imagine how much that would put you vulnerable to the people who did control time? Absolutely. So, and here's a great example. This is Harrison's marine chronometer. And in the 1700s, the Royal Navy um, set a task to create a time device that would allow them to navigate the seas with more accuracy. And um, because clocks with pendulums couldn't be used at sea. And Harrison went through several iterations. So I'm going to show you H1, that's his first one, um, uh, through to what ended up being Harrison's marine cr chronometer, which is basically a wristwatch. And as a result of this simple invention, one might think, um, the Royal Navy was able to maintain its dominance over the oceans for 300 years and, and arguably wow. set up the British Empire. So that's how... how Sorry, how long ago was the uh, that wristwatch uh, invented? How long ago are we talking about? Um, I think it's around about the 1700s, the middle 1700s. What, this one here, H5? H5, yeah. Yeah. So, so fairly recently, really. Yeah, it is, yeah. But if you go back to ancient times, um, people made a lot of effort to be able to chart the time and um, repeat that uh, regularly for long periods of time hmm. and they did it for a reason they wanted to um, be in control and they certainly didn't want to be out of control and have someone else do it and that's one of the reasons why the star maps of Gwyneth are so big and uh, it, it is because it required a community to be there to um, maintain them and that's why they're uh, you know there's so many people in the area but it also allowed multiple measurements to be taken and then to be conferred upon because they were they were giving um, leap years and uh, making sure the planets are in the proper places that sort of thing mm. so who made the star maps well we're told in the book of enoch that it is the watchers well who are the watchers well um as i um, researched the star maps Gwyneth I realized the Welsh language is extremely old and the, this part of North Wales it hasn't changed hardly at all and um, so I employ several um, of the oldest Welsh dictionaries to translate a lot of these terms so the watchers if we look at this word in the dictionary this dictionary is up 200 years old is the does gwili and that's made up of two words gwil and dusgi and that means the teachers of festivals or sites that's who the watchers were Very and another another word uh, another explanation is the oriaur that's to watch and this this um suffix ur uh can be applied to lots of words. So a farm, well, you can see here too, a tavern is a pub, a tavernur is a landlord, tridan is electricity, tridanwir is an electrician. And it's just, we have the same thing in English, you know, farm, farmer. Mm. So the watchers were the timekeepers and that's why they set up the star maps of Gwyneth. So how did they do that? Well, here is a diagram to, to demonstrate the question you asked earlier, Paul. So there's the sun. As we, the Earth, go around the sun, the sun appears to go around us and it charts a course through the 12 constellations of the ecliptic. 
And at the same time, as we go around the sun, we can see the planets going around uh, the ecliptic because we're all going around in the same plane. And uh, the outside planets look to go a lot slower because we go inside them and the, in, uh, the, the planets on the inside go a lot quicker and they seem to go backwards and stop still and then carry on. So how did they um, determine time? Well, Jupiter's orbit is 12 years, so it spends one year in each constellation. That becomes very useful. Mars orbit is two years. So it spends two months in every constellation around the ecliptic. So immediately you start getting a sense of how the planets and the constellations can be used as a time measuring system. So here is the image we saw a little earlier. That's the ecliptic because all the planets are in a line. That is Aquarius constellation, that is Pisces. Now this was, um, well, this date is stated as five quarters moon, uh, Venus and Jupiter in Pisces, and I've just made them a bit bigger so we can see them, and Saturn there and Mars in Aquarius. That's Aquarius. So this, this um, representation of the time is unique. It's not like our present time me uh, measuring system where Today's date is 5th of December 2022 and requires a start point and then a counting of numbers to get to today's date and year. This representation of time is absolutely unique and is the same all over the planet. So the ancient civilization that built the star maps of Gwyneth were global in outlook. They understood all the stars and knew it was important to keep time and communicate over the surface of the earth. And it's an important point that it makes no sense at all for the star maps of Gwyneth to be built only by and only for the people of North Wales. They would have had no use of it on their own and, it, and this scale of undertaking would have made no payback. So it must have been made by a people who were not from North Wales and had a far greater scope that they needed this device to be built for. So we are told in British mythology that Idris, one of the three great astronomers of Britain, mapped the planets from his chair atop Kada Idris. So uh, this is an image of um, Idris sitting atop Kada Idris and it's from Giants of Stonehenge and Ancient Britain by Hugh Newman and Jim Vieira and the image is made by Dan Lish. And so one of your questions that you discuss with me is who who, who was Idris? Well, he was Enoch. Um, but if when we I, um, analyze Idris's name using our Welsh dictionaries, Id means Lord and Ri or Ris or Rid means chief points and courses. So this might, might actually just have been a title like um, president or mm. um, general. But Idris was the a uh, lord or chief astronomer of the courses that charted and controlled the stars and planets. A cadder is a chair, but it's also, the, um, as we use it today, the leader of a committee or the controller. So we got um, more information from the Book of Enoch than the Bible. Bible uh, Genesis chapter 5 tells us that Enoch walked with God and for God took him. But in the book of Enoch, we are told that Enoch received instruction from Uriel about the courses of the luminaries of heaven according to their names and places of origin and according to their months and how it is with regard to all the years of the world and unto eternity. So I believe we have been told a recipe for creating a time system.
names, origins, months, years, and to eternity. You know, they, they were very um, bold and far, far looking in terms of what they were trying to achieve. In the third book of Enoch, we are told that the month of the winter solstice has days half as long as the nights. So from this day, day light chart, you can see here the month, not on the wind, on the solstice, but the month of, of 30 days of the solstice, the day length is half the night length, and it's the same but reversed for the summer solstice. And this only happens at 52 and a half degrees north or south, and Cad Idris is 52. 7 degrees north and we're told that in the book of Enoch and the book of Enoch um, its providence is it's at least first millennium BCE because it was found fragments of it were found with the Dead Sea Scrolls and they've been carbon dated uh, the first book of Enoch goes on and says they brought me to a mountain the point of whose summit reached to heaven that's Cadadris and I saw the places of the luminaries and the treasures of the stars and to the fire of the west which receives every setting of the sun a river of fire discharged itself into the great sea towards the west well this is the Afon Malthach and on Samhain and you can see the river is lit up like it's on fire yeah that's a stunning photo yeah, thank you very much. Oh, you um, took that as well, did you? Well done. It's a great photo. No, no, I actually, um, I actually uh, asked a local photographer to take this. Yeah. I had to give him some very uh, specific instructions, and he probably thought I was mad. <laughs> so he, he actually took the, the cover picture as well. He had to get up there at dawn. Hmm. And um, so I'm very pleased with them. Yeah, brilliant. In the first book of Enoch, um, it also says that uh, I, Enoch, saw at the end of the earth seven mountains of magnificent stones. And these uh, peaks of Kader Idris are all colour coded and they represent what is um, stated in the Book of Enoch. So the Book of Enoch is first millennium BCE and these names have not changed for at least that length of time. So that's, yeah. that's not a coincidence, I don't think. Yeah. So why, why choose Gwyneth for the star maps? Well, it's remote, um, it's very secure, it doesn't suffer earthquakes, volcanoes, well, it does suffer earthquakes, but not bad ones compared to like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, volcanoes, tidal waves, it's mild, it supports life all year round very easily. Um, as we've seen before, Cad Idris is very prominent. There's lots of peaks around, but it, Cad Idris sticks up above them all. And there's the flat datum of the sea to one side, whereas a lot of peaks in Snowdonia, that's not the case. You can't see the sea. And at 52 and a half degrees north, the day length can be checked accurately at the solstices and being halfway between 45 and 60 degrees north, it makes the most accurate estimate for the equinox, the start of the new year and the constellation Aries. So if, you, if we scroll back quickly to this diagram, you can see that if you're at the equator, zero latitude, you've got a day of 12 hours and 12, uh, 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night, every day of the year. You, it's impossible to use the equator to um, check for the, uh, the solstices or the equinoxes. Similarly, if you go up to 60, you've got in the winter, it's just too dark. Mm. And in the summer, it's too light. So 52 and a half degrees north was the optimum because you get this measurement around the month of the solstice, which can be checked. Mm. So scroll forward. So how old are the star maps? Well, Welsh heritage, Cadw, say um, 5,000 years old, Bronze Age, but you know, these are obviously Stone Age, which um, is pr prior to 5,000 years old. 
Um, the, the Bible and the Book of Enoch say um, Enoch is grandfather of Noah. Noah the Noah flood's best estimate is 6,000 years ago. So we're talking over 6,000 years ago, if we believe the Bible and the Book of Enoch. Um, Gebekli Tepe shows a um, representation of the zodiac and that's 12,000 years old so if um, the star maps of Gwyneth was the origin then the star maps of Gwyneth is older than that and there have been rising sea levels in around the whole of the Atlantic coast and the Mediterranean so I think the, um, the stars have been remapped at least once and that was probably done in Gwyneth around about 5500 BCE just looking at the um, sea levels but I think there may well have been something there before that or it was developed somewhere else and brought to North Wales um, we just you know there may be um, uh, other constellations have evolved, as we saw at Lasso, before um, in isolation before the star maps of Gwyneth. I'm, my hypothesis is that this is the origin of the modern zodiac, mm. not that, not that it is the origin of every constellation. So, there's my cursor. So, how old are the star maps? Well, if we go to um, a little town called Hlan, Hlanbrin Mayer, uh, which represents Sirius, and there's a stone circle, and this points to the rising of Sirius to this mountain, and this is exactly 10,000 megalithic yards long. Now Sirius is believed to be in a 26,000 year repeating cycle with our sun. So how many times do you have to watch that cycle to, to know that it is a repeating cycle? Mm. Um, so, but uh, there is this, what I would call a telescope on the, on the landscape here, and all these mountains um, are named to reflect that. Um, and, over the, uh, and this is accurate because it's, it, it's made over such a long distance. So you can actually watch the rising of Sirius and measure it against other stars and how its position varies over a long period of time. Maybe it was built more recently, but the, per the people who built it certainly wanted to m monitor the progress of Sirius against the other stars. And as you can see here, the Pleiades are similarly represented on the star maps of Gwyneth. The ancient or the original inhabitants of Australia brought their myth about the seven sisters uh, for the Pleiades to Australia and then were isolated for 50,000 years. So that myth and the explanation of seven sisters is at least 50,000 years old and they are represented faithfully on the star maps of Gwyneth. Wow. So how old are oh, the star maps? Well, perhaps we will never know, but the people who um, conceptualized it and developed the star maps, they named the planets in the stars. So Mars, Moth is the greatest. Mercury, Mercha is the quickest, most erratic. Venus, Gwena is the brightest. Jupiter, EI is the youngest and we get juvenile from this word mm -hmm. Saturn 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 is the steadiest and that's what their names mean I just want to convey the incredible capability of these ancient people mm. um, there is an estimate that Jupiter arrived in our or there is a hypothesis that Jupiter arrived in our solar system about 70,000 years ago. It was part of um, Schultz's star group. And as the star group moved, system moved through our solar system, it was captured by our sun. And then there was a sort of like cosmic car crash game of billiards in our solar system. And that's the source of a lot of our myth about Saturn being um, deposed by Jupiter. 
but the best estimate of that is 70,000 years ago. So on the star maps of Gwynedd, there are three types of star map. So we've already looked at Ursa Major or the Plough, and as you can see, the peaks of Cada Idris are quite a good close match to the stars above in Ursa Major. And close by to Ursa Major is the um, constellation Corona Borealis. Now this is a very distinct C shape in the night sky and there are not enough mountains in the area of this part of the star map to um, make a close fit. So the ancient people, they've created two lakes by um, uh, having artificial thresholds and then a, a, a ring of standing stones and stone circles to represent the constellation Corona Borealis. And this is um, in the ancient British tradition. This is the uh, this constellation is represented by Ariane Rod and her Wheel of Fate, part of which um, sits in the mortal world, which is this bit here, the the pink part and part of it that sits in the underworld. So again, as I said earlier, water is very important. It's the transition or the, the boundary between the mortal world and the underworld. So part of her wheel goes under here. And I think at the start of um, our discussion, you, you showed a picture of Ariane Rod from my book. Mm -hmm. And there's the third type of star map on the star maps of Gwyneth, and this is the proof that the star maps of Gwyneth is the origin of the zodiac. So um, the third type are where the stars above are actually chosen to reflect the ground below and not the other way around. So you can see Pisces here, the constellation, the stars in the sky above. So we've got some bright stars here that, uh, that aren't in any constellation. We've got some sort of bright ones in the middle. And these stars, have been chosen to reflect the grounds below. And um, such was the confidence of these people that they actually determined what stars were grouped in specific constellations in the heavens above and not the other way around. So let's come back to the star maps. And we talked about there's the ecliptic again. This white hatching is the Milky Way. When you know the ecliptic, you can um, find all of these um, uh, constellations that are all named and into the ground and represented by rivers or mountains. And here is the ecliptic and here are the um, constellations of the zodiac and only when considering the constellations in their proper places with their adjacent constellations in the original language do the meanings of their names positions and roles make sense it is by design that gemini gemini the twins is placed between a bull taurus and a crab cancer it is not random gem min I means the boss on the edge, the crossing of the Milky Way at the ecliptic. That's the edge, the ecliptic, because above it is the mortal world and beneath it is the underworld. Libra means end of the flow. Libra is the edge of the Milky Way flow as it crosses the ecliptic. Sad e to ri us means the fixed point of the circle and the chief course. So again, wow, yeah. is um, the Milky Way and the chief course is the ecliptic or the other way around, but that's what it means. Every constellation has its proper place and its name explains its locations in the heavens. So what I'm going to do now is just put on the Milky Way. Oops. Get my cursor back. Where's it gone? There it is. 
there's the Milky Way. So now you can see Gemini is the point of the crossing of the brink. That's the Milky Way. So we have the spirit plane. The spiritual concepts believed by the ancient people are actually enshrined in the ground features of the star map. So fundamentally, there are three planes, the spirit plane, and that's inhabited by our ancestors, the mortal plane, which is where we live, and the underworld. Now, in the ancient British mythology, the underworld is not hell. That's a modern creation. Mm. The world is our last journey on the great ship along the Milky Way from the mortal world to the west to be with our ancestors so that we can join them and um, return with the benevolence of our ancestors through the spirit plane into the mortal world. And it's a continuing cycle. That's very interesting, Hugh, because I believe the uh, the Egyptians or the ancient Egyptians didn't have a word for death. They, they referred to it as Westing. Yeah, and that's why um, Tolkien wrote about the West, because as professor of English at um, Oxford University and having spent all of his childhood vacations in Wales, um, he, was, he uh, realized that this great spiritual um, understanding was about to be lost at, in the early 1920s. And so he created the Lord of the Rings to make sure that it was never lost. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So the Milky Way joins these three planes, and I call it a travelator. It's the great travelator of spirit of goodness. This is called Arwen in the ancient language, and Gwen is a smile, a ray of sunshine or goodwill. And the A prefix creates emphasis, like using very. And Gwe is the root for web or network so Arwen is this wonderful net network of goodwill that is flowing along the milky way from our ancestors into the mortal world and then helps us on our last journey to the west and it's not uh, a coincidence that the two um, constellations that guard the entrance of the spirit world of spirit into the mortal world, both have stingers. So there's Scorpio and the Pabil Sagos, um, Sagittarius represented on the Dendera Zodiac and the Babylonian Zodiac, so they had stingers like a scorpion stinger. And similarly, it's not a coincidence that there are two pairs of twins on the exit of the Milky Way from the mortal world into the underworld, but one of them has been changed in the Ptolemaic time to Canis Minor. So at the, the Milky Way uh, rises to the top of the celestial heavens at Cepheus and Cassiopeia, the king and the queen. So I will just put on the Milky Way. So it rises up to the top of the celestial heavens and it then flows down from Don's cauldron, she's the queen, into the Afon Dufidui, and therefore into all of the mortal world, uh, rivers of the mortal world. And this was the only water that was supposedly used by the Druids in their ceremonies because it was so, um, so holy and spiritually good. So I made these paintings because if you do a Google image search of Zeus, you get like three, th three million images, but there's not a single image of um, the king of our British um, uh, celestial uh, pantheon. Uh, so I, I just drew him there or painted mm. him holding up the heavens. And then I did one of Don, Don's cauldron and pouring all this goodness of the Milky Way into the mortal world. They're absolutely stunning, you. Well done. Thanks very much. <laughs> so, um, so the Milky Way crosses the eclipse again 
and uh, goes into the underworld. There sails the great ship constellation on this stream of benevol benevolence, taking departed souls on their last journey. And I have recreated the great ship constellation because in the 1930s, it was actually broken up by the International Astronomical Union. They thought it was too big and ought to be several constellations, which really is a great shame because it is um, very central to uh, the spirituality of a very ancient people. Mm. And the epic of creation also appears in shrines in the constellations above and on the ground uh, in Gwyneth. Kada Idris and the Plough is central to this story. The myths of Hugh Gadarn or the Sumerian god Enlil are the ploughmen. Now the constellation is called Bootes. There's Bootes. Uh, there's the plough. So the, the ploughman is holding the, the, the plough. And there's Virgo. Virgo is sort of lying down now because see i think the sea levels rose and so she had to lie down but in the very oldest representation she's standing up but anyway you have the sort of like the the two people that started off the human race and they um he's holding a plow the plow is attached to the um origa the harness to the bull and there's the field so this is a metaphor for plowing a field is a metaphor for um recreating humanity from the last cataclysm which is you know the enuma elish and other types of um, mythology and in the um in the bible that's they that's, that's what they say noah does after the flood the first thing he does is plant a vineyard and if we reanalyze this phrase using the welsh dictionaries this metaphor translates as establish a pure lineage which was the reason for the flood was to remove the impure and the first thing that Noah did after the flood was establish a pure lineage to establish his right to be the patriarch okay so <clears throat> There is more detail on the star maps of Gwyneth. Um, all the major stars in the, in the night sky are represented on the star maps by a St. Mary's church. And there are no other St. Mary's on the star maps. So these sites are extremely old. There may be churches there now and called St. Mary's, but within the sacred acre of each church is a yew tree and most of these are like 5,000 years old. So that they actually built a church on top of an ancient sacred site. That happens an awful lot, doesn't it, Hugh? Particularly in this country, okay. in Britain, they, they do that an awful lot. Yeah, yeah. And it happens all over the world. You know, if you want to go to Baalbek, you know, the Romans built a temple on top of all manner of other people's temples underneath. Mm. Yeah, and uh, when a new religion uh, tries to... Um, become popular and the mainstream religion they they try to bring all the trappings of the previous religions into their own and call it their own mm -hmm. so mary in the welsh language really means eminence radiance glory what is fair and um gwyn means white what is fair also and it's emblematic of heavens generally and can relate to stars specifically, hence Gwyneth. So the St. Mary's churches represent stars and that's why they're named that way. And similarly, there are specifically um, St. Michael's churches um, around the star maps of Gwyneth and no, none elsewhere. So they are around the ecliptic and also they are guarding the entrance and exit of the Milky Way. And this was St. Michael's role in the Book of Revelations, which was to protect the mortal world from the ingress of, uh, you know, things that they didn't want to come into the mortal world from the underworld. 
and this is faithfully represented on the star maps of Gwynedd as well. So there are the, this is the Travelator, here are the St Michael's churches. And um, the Mabinogi are also represented on the star maps of Gwynedd. In fact, it is probably where it originated. So, um, sorry, are, who, who were the Mabinogi? The Mabinogi is the British creation myths. And I didn't know about the Mabinogi until only a couple of years ago. And I don't think many people in Britain do know about the Mabinogi. Um, but analysing this world, Mab is means um, son of or descendant. Um, and the t two or three suff suffixes that follow, Mab, In, Og, E, basically, if you wanted to have a, a rounded description of what this means, it just means the descendants or the ancestry. So these are our uh, ancestry myths there are four main books and they deal with creation, um, the flood, mm. um, a great um, scattering of peoples and then um, disturbance in the heavens. And there are several other um, associated books which were probably added to the main four books and they have been um sort of like manipulated in more modern times to reflect uh, more modern characters but they originated on the star maps of Gwynedd um they're called the Penny Arth manuscripts and that's Penny Arth there they were then taken to nearby to the center of the star maps and kept probably by people who'd were closely involved in the star maps and by the middle ages or um they they were i think they were first written down around 1200 ad and um they remained then in welsh until eight the 1800s and um, a concerted effort was then made to translate them into english and um over that period of time um, a lot of uh, there were a lot of problems or wars and um, changing allegiances for a lot, for many years. Books were not allowed to be written in Welsh in Wales, so we're lucky that they survived, and they are very um, similar to a lot of other creation myths, the flood and the epic of creation. So I think they are genuine. Mm. I think just as a, an aside, uh, I think um, the Welsh language is generally, I don't know, I think our, our modern leaders have something against it. I think they made it a law uh, fairly recently that the Welsh language could not be spoken in the House of Commons. Yeah, I don't, I'm not aware of that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So they, they seem to not be very keen on these old languages for some reason. I don't know why. Well, um, there was a concerted effort to um, do away with the Welsh language in the 1920s after um, Ireland left the Union because they, there was a lot of revolutionary fervour around the whole world, um, the October Revolution in Russia and places like that. And the establishment in, in Britain were worried that these um, languages in the British Isles would cause the Union to break up. But, you know, there's no there's no need now to um, think those things and or, or to be suspicious or it's a beautiful language, the Welsh language, yeah. and it's the origin of the English language. And um, I think everyone should learn a little bit of it, perhaps. Definitely. I mean, we started off talking about language and how and how we we've been uh, our history has been severed or, or deleted or whatever you know so yeah. that, that's a, a very good example of it isn't it it's disconnecting us from our our old languages yeah okay so um the star maps of Gwynedd is a vast ancient intercontinental interconnecting physical and spiritual 
world. It's built on an incredible cosmic scale of time, space and comprehension. It really does demonstrate um, the, the capabilities of our ancient ancestors and it's been maintained faithfully right up to the present day pretty much. Um, there are some changes happening now and have done in the last few decades but go back to the 50s and 60s of the last century there was still very very faithfully being maintained and um, it does give us a connection with the people of the antediluvian world and that is why i believe it is the most important ancient artifact on earth because no other ancient artifact does this you know we can look at the pyramids and the sphinx but we can't listen to what the people thought um, and how they represented these artifacts to the world we can only guess but with the ancient, um, with the Psalm Apps of Gwyneth, we can actually hear what they thought because they um, wrote it down into the land and into the constellations. And now we have a tool where we can um, analyze other things from that ancient civilization. So here are my two books. That's, um, I've finished The Origin of the Zodiac, and that's available at my website there. And um, I'm currently writing The Origin of Time, which is the companion and completes the work of The Origin of the Zodiac. And then in The Origin of Time, I talk more about the constellations and these three main rings. Um, these three main rings that form a sphere, the ecliptic, the Milky Way, and the epic of creation. So that's, um, wow. that's in the book, uh, The Origin of Time. And, on my YouTube channel, I'm going in some sort of more fun subjects, perhaps in, in bite-sized amounts, you know, what, an, what the unicorn means, the Eye of Horus, because the proto-dynastic pharaohs arrived on in Egypt with their Horus um, mythology already in place, and their, their emblems had the Horus hawk on. So um, what does that mean? I've, I'm slowly going to go through all the planets and the constellations so that's my presentation fantastic stuff thank you um, so much you that was absolutely you, fascinating i need to get back to the whoops get oh. back to the, to there probably stop sharing there we go um, are we back we're back yes yeah. there we are so so much to digest with all that um i'm making my way through the book at the moment it's uh, an absolutely brilliant read um and i'm actually learning loads as well because i'm i'm pretty much a layman or a student of this subject so it's a great it's a great companion to have as well if you're learning about the zodiac and astronomy thank you um but i think the the evidence that you've presented is extremely convincing i mean thank you it's, um, I think we're talking about probably this being the uh, the biggest discovery since Gobekli Tepe in, in ancient history. So, so congratulations and thank, thank you for you. sharing your work. I really would like to have you on again in the not too distant future, possibly. Yeah, to, yeah, to discuss your your uh, book that's about to come out. Yeah, um, that looks fascinating as well. So, um, thank you so much, Hugh. Um, please like, share and subscribe, everyone. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again. Cheers. Okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Cheers, Bye.